As Marx famously states that, it is a fundamental truth that a society must continuously reproduce the conditions necessary for production alongside the act of production itself, or it would not be sustainable even for a year. The essence of production lies in the reproduction of these conditions, whether in a straightforward manner or maintaining the existing conditions or by expanding them. So what does it mean to reproduce the conditions of production? This question delves into a realm that is both deeply familiar and yet often overlooked. The seemingly self-evident truths rooted in the perspective solely of production or even in practical productive activities themselves are so ingrained in our everyday consciousness that it becomes exceedingly difficult, if not nearly impossible, to shift our perspective to that of reproduction. However, without this shift, everything remains abstract and even distorted, particularly when considering production and even more so practical activities. To simplify, let's assume that a society arises from a dominant mode of production. In this context, the process of production engages the available productive forces within specific relations of production. Consequently, for a society to continue existing, it must simultaneously reproduce the conditions necessary for its production while engaging in the act of production itself. This involves the reproduction of the productive forces and the existing relations of production. It is acknowledged, including by bourgeois economists, whose focus lies in national accounting or modern macroeconomic theory, that Marx convincingly demonstrated in Capital Volume 2 that production must allow for the reproduction of the material conditions necessary for production itself namely the means of production. The typical economist, much like the typical capitalist, understands the importance of annually forecasting the requirements for replacing what has been depleted or worn out in the process of production. Raw materials, fixed assets such as buildings, production equipment like machinery and so forth. This perspective essentially reflects the viewpoint of the firm which tends to regard commentary on its financial accounting practices as sufficient. However, the groundbreaking in Quesnay, who initially posed this crucial issue, and Marx, who provided a resolution, have illuminated that the reproduction of material production conditions cannot be adequately grasped at the level of the individual firm. This is because it does not manifest at that, that level within its actual conditions. What occurs at the firm level is merely an effect, providing only a glimpse into the necessity of reproduction while failing to reveal its underlying conditions and mechanisms. A moment of reflection is enough to understand, to understand this. Consider Mr. X a capitalist operating a spinning mill producing woolen yarn. He must indeed reproduce his raw materials, machinery and so forth. However, he does not produce these elements for his own use. Other capitalists do. For instance, an Australian sheep farmer, Mr. Y, or a heavy engineer manufacturing machine tools, Mr. Rizet, fulfill this role and so on. Mr. Y and Mr. Rizet, in turn, must reproduce the conditions of their own production to enable the production of the goods is for Mr. X's reproduction of production conditions. This chain extends indefinitely, ensuring that demand for means of production for reproduction can be met by supply on both national and global markets. To understand this intricate mechanism, which resembles an endless chain, one must adopt Marx's comprehensive approach and delve into the study of capital circulation relations between Department 1 responsible for producing means of production and Department 2 responsible for producing means of consumption, as well as the realization of surplus value.
one crucial aspect within this is the reproduction of the productive forces specifically the reproduction of labor power this is distinct from reproduction of the means of production from the examination of firm operations particularly through the lens of financial accounting practices account for depreciation and investment we have gained a rough understanding of the material process of reproduction however we are now entering a realm where observation within the firm is if not entirely blind largely obscure this is because the reproduction of labor of labor power predominantly occurs outside the firm's boundaries how is the reproduction of labor power ensured it is achieved by providing labor power with the necessary material means for its own reproduction namely through wages while wages are indeed included in the accounting of the accounting of each enterprise they are categorized as wage capital and not explicitly recognized as a condition for the material reproduction of labor power however in practice wages represent only the portion of the value produced by the expenditure of labor power that is essential this includes covering the costs of housing food and clothing essentially enabling the wage earner to return to the workplace each day along with supporting the upbringing and education of children who represent the future labor power of the proletariat it is important to note that this this value necessary for reproduction of labor power is not solely determined by a biological minimum wage but also by historical factors marx observed that the specific needs of workers vary historically influenced by cultural and social factors this minimum wage is not merely defined by the historical needs recognized by the capitalist class but is rather shaped by the historical demands imposed by the proletarian class struggle this struggle encompasses efforts to resist the lengthening of the working day and to combat in wages however ensuring the material conditions for the reproduction of labor power is not enough to guarantee its reproduction as labor power labor power must also possess the necessary competencies to function within the complex system of the production process the development of product of productive forces and the specific unity characteristic of these forces at any given time necessitate that labor power be skilled accordingly tailored to meet the requirements of the socio technical division of labor and its various roles and positions in capital capitalist societies unlike those characterized by slavery or serfdom the reproduction of labor power skills increasingly occurs outside of the production process itself this is achieved primarily through the capitalist education system and other institutions what do children learn in school learn in school while the specifics vary they typically acquire fundamental skills such as reading writing and arithmetic along with other elements of scientific or literary culture these skills directly contribute to different roles in production with varying levels of instruction provided for man technicians engineers and higher management in essence they acquire the necessary know how required for their future roles in the workforce in addition to acquiring technical skills and knowledge children at school also learn the norms of behavior expected within the division of labor ta- tailored to the roles they are destined to fulfill this includes moral civic and professional standards which essentially translate into respect for the socio technical division of labor and ultimately adherence to the order established by class domination they are taught to speak in the appro- appropriate manner to interact with workers correctly and for future capitalists and their associates to issue commands effectively essentially they are trained to uphold the ruling ideology and for those in positions of exploitation and repression to manipulate it adeptly to maintain class to put it more precisely the reproduction of labor power necessitates not only the transmission of skills but also the perpetuation of submission to the established order 
a reproduction of adherence to the ruling ideology for workers and a reproduction of the ability to manipulate this city to manipulate this ideology effectively for exploiters and oppressors all individuals involved in production exploitation and repression not to mention the ideologists themselves must be indoctrinated in this ideology to carry out their roles diligently thus the reproduction of of labor power hinges not just on the perpetuation of skills but also on the perpetuation of ideological subjection or the adept practice of the ruling ideology it is important to recognize that ideological subjection is integral to the reproduction of labor power this acknowledgement unveils the significant presence of a new reality Althusser emphasizes the revolutionary aspect of the Marxist conception of the social whole which is distinct from Hegel's notion of totality. Marx envisioned the structure of every society as comprising levels or instances interconnected by a specific determinant the economic base that is the unity of productive forces and relations of production and the superstructure which encompasses the politico legal that is law and the state and ideological realms comprising various ideologies such as religious ethical ethical legal and political ideologies beyond its theoretical significance in distinguishing marx from hegel this representation holds a crucial theoretical advantage it enables the incorporation of what alters or terms the respective indices of effectivity shall concepts but what does this mean exactly consider this representation of society as an edifice with a base supporting the superstructure's two floors this is a metaphor a spatial one to be precise wherein the base is determination in the last instance by the economic by the economic base is emphasized the metaphor serves to attribute an index of effectivity to the base famously known as the determination in the last instance which dictates the events in the upper floors of the superstructure based on economic conditions consequent floors of the superstructure possess varying indices of effectivity determined by the relation to the economic base these floors are not determinants in the last instance but are instead determined by the basis effectivity while they may exhibit a relative autonomy they are ultimately shaped by the base this recognition leads to the acknowledgement of two key aspects within the marxist tradition the relative autonomy of the superstructure and the reciprocal action of the superstructure on the base the primary advantage of this marxist topography lies in its in its revelation of the crucial role of determination or effectivity and its insistence that the base ultimately determines the entire edifice however the metaphorical nature of this representation its descriptive quality possesses a significant limitation alters a proposed is both possible and necessary to approach things differently without rejecting the classical metaphor outright but rather by moving beyond it to achieve a deeper understanding by adopting the viewpoint of reproduction many questions implied by the edifice metaphor but left unanswered can be illuminated alters's fundamental thesis is that these questions particularly those pertaining to the superstructure can only be adequately addressed from the perspective of reproduction alters provides a brief analysis of law the state and ideology from this viewpoint revealing from both the realms of practice and production and those of reproduction the marxist tradition is unequivocal on the nature of the state as outlined in the communist manifesto and the 18 brumer and reiterated in subsequent classical texts particularly marx's writings on the paris commune and lenin's state and revolution the state is explicitly viewed as a repressive apparatus it serves as a machine of repression that enables the ruling classes whether bourgeois or big landowners to maintain their dominance over the working class facilitating the extra- facilitating the extraction of surplus value that is capitalist exploitation the state apparatus 
encompasses not only specialized entities like the police, courts and prisons, but also the military, which intervenes directly as a supplementary force in instances where the police are overwhelmed, as sits the head of state, the government and the administration. This Marxist-Leninist perspective hits upon a crucial point. The state, primarily characterized as a force of repressive execution and intervention in favor of the ruling classes in their struggle against the proletariat, embodies its basic function. However, even in presenting the nature of the state in this manner, the analysis remains somewhat descriptive. The descriptive theory provides a solid foundation for understanding its essence. This descriptive phase is correct in that it effectively correlates numerous observable facts ranging from events like the June 1848 massacres to more subtle forms of domination with the concept of the state as a class state embodied in the repressive state apparatus. However, the descriptive theory alone does not suffice for the development of a comprehensive scientific theory of the state. While it, while it offers a means of identifying instances of oppression and relating them to the state, it can also lead to a kind of static understanding, an acceptance of the apparent truth without delving deeper into the mechanisms at play. To progress beyond this descriptive phase and gain a more profound understanding of the state's, me the state's mechanisms, it is necessary to augment the classical definition of the state as a state apparatus. First and foremost, it is crucial to clarify a fundamental point. The state as manifested its apparatus holds significance solely in its function of wielding state power. The entirety of political class struggle revolves around the contestation of state power, its acquisition, retention, predation by a particular class or a coalition of classes. This distinction compels us to differentiate between state power the attainment or maintenance of state power, and the state apparatus. Althusser observes that the state apparatus can endure even amidst political upheavals like bourgeois revolutions, bourgeois revolutions without undergoing substantial alteration. Political events may affect the possession of state power while leaving the state apparatus largely intact. Even following a social revolution such as the one in 1917, a significant portion of the state apparatus persisted after the proletariat and the small peasantry seized state power, an observation emphasized by Lenin. This distinction between state power and state apparatus is fundamental aspect of the Marxist theory of the state, which has been explicitly present since Marxist writings such as the 18 Brummer and class struggles in the state is identified with its repressive apparatus. State power and state apparatus are distinct entities. The objective of class struggle revolves around the attainment of state power, leading to the utilization of the state apparatus by the ruling classes or their alliances to further their class interests. These state power to dismantle the existing bourgeois state apparatus and initially replace it with the proletarian state apparatus. Subsequently, a radical process ensues aiming at the abolition of the state altogether. While these principles are integral to the Marxist theory of the state, Althus are condensed that they still possess descriptive elements. Even with the proposed addition, this theory remains somewhat descriptive. However, it now encompasses more intricate and differential components whose functioning and impact necessitate further theoretical development. To augment the, Marxist the augment the Marxist theory of the state, we need to introduce another dimension, a terrain that the Marxist classics engaged within their practical endeavors but did not fully systematize into theoretical form. This dimension extends beyond the distinction between state power and the state apparatus and involves a reality that, al that aligns with the repressive state apparatus but differs from it significantly. Althusser refers to this reality by its conceptual term, the ideological state apparatuses, ISAs. What exactly are the ideological state apparatuses? It is essential to distinguish state apparatus. In Marxist theory, the state apparatus encompasses entities like the government, administration, army, police, courts, and prisons, collectively constituting what Althusser terms the repressive state apparatus. 
The term repressive suggests that this apparatus first functions through coercion, albeit ultimately as repression may take non-physical forms such as administrative measures. On the other hand, ideological state apparatuses manifest a distinct and specialized institutions readily observable by the immediate observer. Althusser compiles an, em compiles an empirical list of these ideological state apparatuses, subject to detailed examination, testing, correction and reorganization. First, religious ideological state apparatus comprising various churches and religious institutions. Second, educational ideological state apparatus encompassing both public and private schools. Third, family ideological state apparatus. Fourth, legal ideological state apparatus. Five, political ideological state apparatus encompassing political systems and parties. Six, trade union ideological. Seven, communications ideological state apparatus encompassing press, radio, television, etc. Eight, cultural ideological state apparatus encompassing literature, arts, sports, etc. It is vital to emphasize that the ideological state apparatuses should not be confused with the repressive state apparatus. Several distinctions explain this difference. Firstly, while there exists a single repressive state apparatus, there is a plurality of ideological state apparatuses. The unity that underpins this plurality of ideological state apparatuses as a collective entity is not, is not immediately apparent. Secondly, Whereas this repressive state apparatus predominantly operates within the public domain, a substantial portion of the ideological state apparatuses, despite their apparent dispersal, belongs to the private domain. Entities like churches, political parties, trade unions, families, certain schools, most newspapers and cultural enterprises fall under the private domain. While the repressive state apparatus operates predominantly through coercion, the ideological state apparatuses function mainly through ideology with secondary involvement in repression. Some may qu question the clarification of private institutions as ideological state apparatuses, but this distinction is essential. Gramsci highlighted that the public-private dichotomy is a construct of bourgeois law irrelevant to the state's domain, which transcends such distinctions. Similarly, whether an institu institution is public or private matters less than how it functions. Private entities can effectively serve as ideological state apparatuses, as demonstrated by a thorough analysis of any ideological state apparatus. Crucially, both state apparatuses operate through a combination of violence and, ide and ideology. However, the repressive state apparatus primarily relies on repression, while the ideological state apparatuses predominantly function through ideology, employing repression secondarily, albeit in subtle and often concealed ways. The unity among diverse ideological state apparatuses lies in their shared functioning through ideology, albeit beneath the ruling ideology, which reflects the interests of the ruling class, despite their contradictions ideological state apparatuses ultimately serve to reproduce the ruling ideology. The ruling class which wields state power also influences ideological state apparatuses ensuring the dominance of its ideology. Ideological state apparatuses are not only objects but also sites of class struggle. Unlike the repressive state apparatus where the ruling class can exert direct control, ideological state apparatus exploited classes challenging hegemonic ideologies and seeking to assert their interests. This discussion underscores the importance of understanding the role and significance of ideological state apparatuses. They play a vital role in reproducing and contesting dominant ideologies, shaping social norms and, perpetuate and perpetuating or challenging power structures. Their function, rooted in ideology rather than coercion, is pivotal in maintaining class hegemony and perpetuating social order. Moving beyond the descriptive language of the base superstructure metaphor, we can assert that it is primarily secured through the exercise of state power in the state apparatuses, namely the repressive state apparatus and the ideological state apparatuses. This, assert this assertion can be summarized with three key features. 
first dual functionality all state apparatuses function through both repression and ideology however the repressive state apparatus predominantly relies on repression while apparatuses predominantly function through ideology second multiplicity and autonomy unlike the centralized and unified organization of the repressive state apparatus ideological state apparatuses are multiple distinct and relatively autonomous relatively autonomous they provide an objective field for expressing contradictions arising from class struggle third unity through ruling ideology while the repressive state apparatus is unified under the leadership of the ruling class the unity of the ideological state is usually maintained albeit in contradictory forms through the ruling ideology considering these features the reproduction of the relations of production can be understood through a division of labor the repressive state apparatus primarily ensures the political reproduction of exploitative relations of production through physical or administrative force it not only perpetuates its own existence but also secures the conditions for the functioning of the ideological state apparatuses by enforcing political constraints censorships censorship and other forms of repression in reality it is the ideological state apparatuses that primarily ensure the reproduction of the relations of production operating behind the protective shield provided by the repressive state apparatus the ruling ideology upping ideology upheld by the ruling class holding state power plays a crucial role in mediating a harmony between repressive state apparatus and the various ideological state apparatuses considering the diversity of ideological state apparatuses and their shared role in reproducing relations of production we can imagine the following in capitalist societies numerous ideological state apparatuses are at work including the educational religious family political trade union communications and cultural apparatus however in pre capitalist feudal societies the number of ideological state apparatuses was smaller and their functions different for instance during the middle ages the church consolidated various functions later developed on to separate ideological ses in capitalist societies alongside the church other ideological state apparatuses such as the family political and proto trade union apparatuses played significant roles historically the dominant ideological state apparatus was the church which held religious educational and communicative functions the french revolution aimed not only to transfer state power but also to challenge the church's dominant ideological role leading to the establishment of new ideological state apparatuses like the educational apparatus despite the bourgeoisie's initial reliance on the political ideological state apparatus notably parliamentary democracy for ideological hegemony the educational ideological state apparatus gradually assumed dominance this shift was a result of violent political and ideological struggles aimed at replacing the old dominant ideological state apparatuses with new ones better suited for the reproduction of capitalist relations of production therefore it can be argued that in mature capitalist societies is the educational ideological apparatus occupies the dominant position among ideological state apparatuses despite the common perception that the political ideological apparatus holds this role in recent history the bourgeoisie has demonstrated its ability to adapt its ability to adapt to various political ideological state apparatuses other than parliamentary democracy such as empires constitutional monarchy and presidential democracy for example in france different political regimes including empires and constitutional monarchies have coexisted with bourgeois interests 
Similarly, in England, a compromise was reached between bourgeoisie and the aristocracy, allowing them to share state power for an extended period. In Germany, the imperial jungles facilitated the bourgeoisie's rise to power under the Nazi regime. However, behind the scenes of political ideological state apparatuses, the bourgeoisie has established the educational apparatus as its dominant ideological state apparatus. This apparatus has replaced the church in its functions and plays a crucial role in, in reproducing capitalist relations of production. Despite the common perception that the political ideological state apparatus holds dominance, the educational apparatus is more influential. The educational apparatus ensures the reproduction of capitalist relations of exploitation through various means. All ideological state apparatuses contribute to reproducing capitalist relations, each in its unique way. The political apparatus subjects individuals to state ideology, while the communications apparatus instills nationalism and chauvinism, chauvinism through mass media. The religious apparatus reinforces moral values and the family apparatus reinforces social norms. The ruling class's ideology dominates integrating themes of humanism, nationalism and economism into society's fabric silent nature. The school is the most influential ideological state apparatus. It shapes children's ideologies from a young age, providing them with knowledge and values necessary for their societal roles. Children receive education infused with the ruling ideology, preparing the various class roles from workers to capitalists, technicians to ideologists. Each segment of the population receives an ideology suited to its class role. Workers are instilled with a consciousness of exploitation, while agents of exploitation and repression are, and repression are trying to maintain the status quo. Professional ideologists manipulate consciousnesses using moralistic and nationalistic rhetoric. Certainly, many virtues and vices such as modesty, cynicism or confidence are taught in various social institutions family, the church, the military, literature, films and even sports arenas. However, none of these institutions have the same widespread or obligatory audience as the educational system within capitalist societies. With children spending eight hours a day, five or six days, five or six days a week in school, the educational apparatus becomes a powerful tool for the reproduction of capitalist relations of production. Through the educational system wrapped in the ideology of the ruling class, the relations between exploiters and exploited are largely perpetuated. The mechanism is obscured by the prevailing ideology of the school which portrays it as a neutral and ideology-free environment where teachers entrusted with children by their parents guide them toward freedom and responsibility. Althusser acknowledges the teachers who, despite difficult, difficult circumstances, strive to resist the dominant ideology and systems within which they operate. They are heroes in their own right. However, many teachers either fail to recognize or actively contribute to the perpetuation of the ideological representation of the school. Their dedication, their dedication inadvertently sustains the belief that the school is a natural and beneficial institution, much like how the church was perceived by previous generations. The school has replaced the church as the dominant ideological state apparatus, functioning in tandem with the family. The affecting education systems worldwide, often paralleled by crisis within family structures, hold significant political implications. The school, along with the family, plays a crucial role in reproducing the relations of production within capitalist societies, making it a prime target in the ongoing. The term ideology was originally coined by Kabani, Destut de Tracy, and their associates who defined it as the study of ideas. However, when Marx adopted the term 50 years later, he imbued it with a fundamentally different meaning even in his early writings. 
For Marx, ideology referred to the system of ideas and beliefs that shape the consciousness of individuals or social groups. His engagement in ideological and political struggles compelled him to delve deeper into this concept. However, we encounter an intriguing paradox here. Despite the natural inclination for Marx to develop a theory of ideology, his seminal works seem to skirt around the issue. Though the German ideology, written after his 1844 manuscripts, provides some insights into ideology, it is not distinctly Marxist. Similarly, while Capital contains references to various ideologies, particularly critiquing the ideas of the vulgar economists, it does not present a comprehensive theory of ideology itself, which relies heavily on a broader understanding of ideology. With that said, Althusser proposes a preliminary and schematic outline of such a theory. These propositions are not made lightly but require rigorous examination and analysis to be confirmed or refined. Ideology has no history. Althusser begins by explaining the fundamental rationale that underpins or at least justifies the endeavor to formulate a theory of ideology in general rather than a theory of specific ideologies which regardless of their form religious, ethical, legal or political invariably reflect class positions. It is evident that any theory of ideologies must encompass two essential dimensions as previously suggested. Firstly, such a theory must be grounded in the history of social formations, including the modes of production operative within them, as well as the class struggles that unfold within these formations. In this regard, it becomes apparent that ideologies defined within the dual framework mentioned earlier are historically contingent phenomena their ultimate determination lying outside the realm of ideology alone, though intricately intertwined. Conversely, Althusser proposes the project of a theory of ideology in general and assert its foundational role in theories of ideologies. This assertion implies a seemingly paradoxical proposition. Ideology has no history. This formulation articulated explicitly in the German ideology marks a departure from a positivist and historicist perspective. In Marx's conception, ideology is depicted as an illusion, a mere dream devoid of substance. Its reality is extrinsic to it, akin to the theoretical status of, dream, status of dreams in pre-Freudian psychology. Marx presents ideology as a constructed fabrication, a hollow semblance fashioned from the detritus of daily life, lacking intrinsic historical agency. Thus, the assertion that ideology has no history in the German ideology is a negative assertion, signifying both the emptiness of ideology as a dreamlike construct and its lack of inner and historical trajectory. However, the thesis Althusser advocates diverges markedly from the positivist stance of the German ideology. Alters are convinced that while ideas possess their own historical trajectory, though ultimately determined by the class struggle, ideology in general is devoid of historical specificity but in a positive sense. This positivist interpretation suggests that ideology exhibits a structural and functional constancy that, ren that renders it a non-historical reality, an omni-historical reality permeating the fabric of history in an immutable form. This view aligns with Marx's characterization of history as the history of class struggles, emphasizing the continuity of ideology across different historic folks marked by class societies. To draw a theoretical parallel, Althusser combats this proposition, ideology has no history, to Freud's assertion regarding the eternal nature of the unconscious. In Freudian terms, the unconscious is portrayed as an enduring, trans-historical entity, immutable in form throughout history. Similarly, ideology, conceived as eternal in this sense, persists unchanged across the sweep of history. In light of these considerations, Althusser posits that a theory of ideology in general 
compared to Freud's theory of the unconscious, is theoretically warranted. For simplicity's sake, Althusser employs the term ideology to denote ideology in general, which Althusser have argued possesses an eternal, immutable character throughout the history of class societies. So for now, Althusser confines his analysis to class societies and their historical trajectory. Ideology is a representation of the imaginary relationship of, to their real conditions of existence. To delve into his central thesis regarding the structure and operation of ideology, it is essential to present two theses, one negative and the other positive. The first thesis pertains to the object represented in the imaginary form of, imaginary form of ideology, while the second thesis addresses the materiality of ideology. The first thesis is, ideology represents the imaginary relationship of individuals to their real conditions of existence. Commonly, we refer to religious ideology, ethical ideology, ideology legal ideology, political ideology and the like as world outlooks. Even if we do not genuinely subscribe to these ideologies as truths, such as believing in God, duty, justice, etc., we acknowledge them as largely imaginary, meaning they do not correspond to reality. However, despite their lack of correspondence to reality, ideologies do allude to reality and can be interpreted to reveal the truth behind their imaginary representations. Interpretations of ideologies vary, with some viewing them as constructs forged despots to manipulate and control individuals. Others, like Feuerbach and Marx, attribute the imaginary nature of ideologies to the alienating conditions of existence within society. Regardless of the interpretation, all agree on one point. Ideologies reflect the real condition, conditions of existence of individuals, though in distorted and imaginary ways. However, Althusser posits that ideologies primarily represent not the real conditions of existence themselves, but rather the relationship of individuals to those conditions, a crucial distinction. In ideologies do not reflect the actual relations of production, but rather the imaginary relationship of individuals to these relations. Thus, the question shifts from the cause of the imaginary distortion to why individuals perceive their relations to social relations in an, imaginary in an imaginary manner and what characterizes this imaginariness. This reframing of the question undermines simplistic explanations involving cliques or alienation, opening up a deeper exploration of the nature of ideology. The second thesis is ideology possesses a material existence. Previously, Althusser hints at this thesis by suggesting that the ideas or representations constituting ideology do not exist in an ideal or spiritual realm, but rather have a material existence. While this assertion lacks formal proof, Althusser asks the readers to entertain it favorably, given the principles of materialism. Demonstrating this thesis would require extensive argumentation. The hypothetical proposition of the material existence of ideas or other representations proves useful in analyzing ideology more deeply. Specifically, it aids in understanding that ideologies always manifest within apparatuses and their practices, underscoring their material existence. Though the material existence of ideology within apparatuses differs from that of tangible objects like stones or, rif or rifles, it remains rooted in physical matter. Althusser examines the individuals living within ideology, immersed in a specific representation of the world distorted by their imaginary relation to their conditions of existence, ultimately tied to relations of production and class. Consider an individual who believes in concepts like God, duty or justice. This belief stems from the ideas within the individual's consciousness, shaping their behavior and practical attitudes. For instance, a believer in God may attend church, pray, confess and perform penance, while someone adhering to duty may exhibit corresponding behaviors as dictated by their ideological beliefs. 
Through this framework, we see that the ideological representation acknowledges that individuals, guided by their consciousness and beliefs, align their actions with their ideas. Failure to wicked, suggesting a disconnect between professed beliefs and actual behavior. This discrepancy implies either inconsistency, cynicism or perversion in the individual's adherence to ideology. In every instance, the ideology of ideology acknowledges, judges, despite its distorted nature, that the ideas of a human subject manifest in their actions or should manifest in their actions. If this alignment is lacking, the ideology assigns the individual other ideas corresponding to their performed actions, even if those actions are perverse. This ideology speaks of actions, whereas Althusser will refer to actions embedded within practices. These practices are governed by rituals within the material existence of an ideological apparatus. Whether it is small religious gathering, a funeral, a sports match, a school day, a school day, or a political party meeting. Pascal's provocative statement, kneel down, move your lips in prayer, and you will believe, inverts the conventional order of things, challenging individuals to engage in actions that may lead to belief. This provocative inversion, compared to Christ's message, brings forth not peace, but strife and scandal. Pascal's bold approach underscores the tangible reality behind beliefs. Leaving Pascal to his theological debates, Althusser adopts a more directly Marxist vocabulary for his exploration of these concepts. Thus, when considering, a, when considering a single individual, the material existence of their beliefs lies in their actions within practices governed by rituals dictated by the material ideological apparatus. These actions are influenced by the ideas derived from that apparatus. Though these actions may vary in their gestures to verbal discourse, their essence lies in their manifestation within material practices. This rearrangement of concepts results in the disappearance of the term ideas as purely ideal or spiritual entities. Instead, emphasis shifts to the subject, consciousness, belief and, action, and actions. The critical term here is the subject. From this understanding, two interconnected theses emerge. First, there is no practice without ideology. Second, there is no ideology without the subject and ideology serves the subjects. With these fundamental principles in mind, Althusser now presents his central thesis. Althusser's central thesis is, ideology interpolates individuals as subjects. This thesis is a matter of explicitly stating his previous proposition that there is no ideology except by the subject and for subjects. This means that ideology only, only exists for concrete subjects and its purpose is enabled by the subject, specifically by the category of the subject and its functioning. The category of the subject, though it may appear under various names throughout history, such as the soul in Plato or God, is the fundamental category of all ideologies. It constitutes all ideology regardless of its regional or class-based determinations or historical context, since ideology is timeless. Althusser argues that the category of the subject is constitutive of all ideology because ideology functions to constitute concrete individuals as subjects. In this dual constitution lies the essence of all ideology which manifests as the functioning of ideology in the material forms of its existence. To understand this further, it is crucial to realize that both the writer and the reader are themselves subjects, and therefore ideological subjects. We live naturally in ideology as it forms the basis of our consciousness and beliefs. As St. Paul eloquently stated, it is in the logos or ideology that we live move and have our being. Thus the category of the subject is an inherent obviousness for you and me as we naturally recognize ourselves as subjects. This recognition is an ideological effect as ideology imposes obviousnesses upon us, leading to our natural acceptance and affirmation of them. 
as example of this ideological recognition is when we identify ourselves or others in everyday interactions such as answering it is me when asked who is at the door these rituals of recognition reaffirm our individuality and subjectivity however recognizing ourselves as subjects and engaging in these rituals of recognition only provides us with consciousness of our ideological practices to illustrate why the category of the subject is constitutive of ideology which only exists by constituting concrete subjects as subjects alterser will utilize a specific mode of exposition one that is con that is concrete enough to be recognized yet abstract enough to be thought and understood as knowledge firstly he proposes that all ideology hails or interpolates concrete individuals as concrete subjects through the functioning of the category of the subject this suggests a distinction between concrete individuals and concrete subjects although at this level concrete subjects only exist as supported by concrete individuals ideology acts or functions in a manner that recruits subjects from individuals or transforms individuals into subjects through a process of interpolation or hailing this process can be imagined akin to everyday police hailing hey you there in this scenario when an individual is hailed they turn around thus becoming a subject by recognizing that the hail was addressed to them this recognition occurs seamlessly indicating the immediate and inherent connection between ideology and the individual's subjectivity what seems to take place outside ideology such as in the street actually occurs within ideology the practical workings of ideology often lead individuals to believe they are outside ideology but in reality they are entrenched within it ideology never identifies itself as such it is only through scientific knowledge that one can recognize their immersion in ideology thus ideology continually interpolates individuals as subjects as ideology is eternal althusser abandons the t- framework and asserts that ideology has always already interpolated individuals as subjects consequently individuals are always already subjects this may seem paradoxical but it is the undeniable reality even before birth individuals are appointed as subjects within familial ideological configurations for example an unborn child is already expected to bear its father's name signifying its identity and irreplaceable before birth this familial ideological structure pre appoints the child as a subject shaping its future role as sexual subject based on societal norms and expectations this ideological constraint is reflected in freud's exploration of pregenital and genital stages of sexuality which ality which are deeply ingrained in the unconscious moving forward althusser explores how the actors in the scene of interpolation and their roles are reflected in the structure of all ideology he gives the example of the christian religious ideology the formal structure of all ideology remains con- so althusser focuses on a single example religious ideology which can be extended to other forms such as ethical legal political and aesthetic ideologies consider christian religious ideology in a fictional discourse it might express i address you peter a human individual to proclaim that god exists and you are accountable to him god speaks through my voice affirming your identity as peter created by god for eternity but born in the year of our lord 1920 your place in the world and your actions determine your salvation granting you membership in the glorious christ this discourse though familiar is surprising in its implications religious ideology aims to transform individuals into subjects by interpolating them calling them by their names and designating roles and destinies for them based on their obedience to divine commands however what is remarkable is that remarkable is that this process depends on the existence of a unique absolute other subject god this capital subject interpolates individuals as subjects in his name as evident in religious scriptures where god addresses moses who acknowledges his subjectivity and obeys god's commandments god commandments 
God defines himself as the subject par excellence who interpolates individuals like Moses, making them subjects subjected to him. In theological reflection, humans are seen as mirrors or reflections of God made in his image. God needs subjects just as subjects need God. Forming a re- even in the debauchery, subjects fulfill God's need for them. God duplicates himself by sending his son to earth as a subject forsaken by him but also as the subject both man and god to pave the way for final redemption the resurrection of christ this duplication understanding underscores the necessity for the subject to become a subject and vice versa to tangibly demonstrate to individuals that they are subjects subjected to the subject with the ultimate goal of reentering the lord's bosom on judgment day deciphering this necessity we find that all ideology operates within manipulating individuals as subjects in the name of a unique and absolute subject this mirror duplication is central to ideology ensuring its functioning the absolute subject occupies the unique center and interpolates individuals around it subjecting them to the subject while providing them the guarantee that giving them the guarantee that they are recognized and saved The mirror structure of ideology ensures the interpolation of individuals as subjects their subjection to the subject mutual recognition and absolute guarantee caught in the system subjects work by themselves obedient to various authorities the ambiguity of the term subject reflects the effect of the system individuals are interpolated as free subjects to freely accept their subjection thus working by themselves to reproduce the relations of production and maintain the socio-technical division of labor while the preceding thesis shed light shed light on certain aspects of the superstructure's functioning and its intervention in the base they inevitably leave several important issues unresolved which merit acknowledgement the problem of the total process of reproducing the relations of production The role of ideological state apparatus apparatuses in this process is crucial yet viewing their contribution alone remains abstract the actual realization of reproduction occurs within the processes of production and circulation where mechanisms train workers assign posts etc however in a class succession relations entail exploitation and antagonistic class relations therefore reproduction cannot be more technical operation it is a class undertaking realized through class struggle while the mechanism of ideology can be abstractly articulated it must be contextualized within contextualized within real ideological formations ideologies manifest in institutions rituals and practices contributing to the ruling classes reproduction of power However ideologies are not realized in a vacuum they stem from class struggle and the conditions experiences and practices of antagon understanding the class struggle within ideological state apparatuses is vital but it is just one aspect of a broader struggle ideological state apparatuses represent where ruling ideologies are realized and challenged but ideologies originate from the social classes engaged in the struggle struggle Therefore ideologies are not born within ideological state apparatuses but emerge from the conditions and experiences of conflicting classes thus only from the perspective of classes and their struggle can the origins and dynamics of ideologies in a social formation be fully comprehended